An alliance tempered. Equals RK equals. Part 9. Equals RK equals. Operations Center. Gar HQ. Coruscant. 8 hours. Yularen scowled at a Coruscant's image. The planet floated in the main hollow tank and it was covered by angry red blots signifying protests that transitioned into riots and went out of control. The senators more interested in blaming each other it seems. General Valentra mused after scrolling through the latest update from the Senate. The clones stationed there were getting quite irritated with their posting and that was a testament of how troublesome the senators could be. Officially Tala was the one loyalist remaining in Gar and hopefully that would leave one competent officer in charge if the quasi-coup didn't pan out. Admittedly it was a very thin cover but every little bit might help. They had to break up five fights so far. Valentra shook his head in disbelief. He should know better by now. He knew better than most how politics on Coruscant worked. What happened over the past month was disillusioning even to him. Do we have enough support to make Plan Besh viable? Not yet. Satine was the one to answer. Camino and what's left from Corellia's allies are in. Anax is too, if reluctantly. We may sway Serapin too, though their demands are going to be an issue. Tila winced. Jacking up the prices of the energy they sold to the core worlds was going to cause problems for everyone with the economy being what it was. Cutting their taxes to a third of what they were. Yet what was the alternative? Invade to secure one of the big energy providers for the core? There weren't many alternatives to get enough cheap energy. The cheap part was the rubbing point. Oh, there were alternatives, though they usually required substantial investments and time. Most straightforward was building constellations of satellites near the local stars along with the rest of the infrastructure to store and transport energy. To do it in the necessary quantities for typical core world, that could get expensive. Using solar energy unless you had a large infrastructure in place simply wasn't efficient. A lot of the smaller governments are crying bloody murder. Obi-Wan confirmed. It got worse once World of Camino's support got out. We have the most important industrial centers but that by itself isn't enough. Without the economic framework binding the Republic together their industrial output will suffer tremendously once the stock of resources in place runs out and that won't be far off. Valentra assessed the situation. What made the astounding industrial output of places like Camino was the constant flow of resources and components ready to be assembled. With it further disrupted, they would be in trouble. There was going to be a short grace period when an interruption in the flow of resources could be borne without too much of an issue but once that was passed, they were going to be in trouble. The Gar, no the whole republic, need a political solution and soon. The riots are getting worse too. Making your declaration live on the Holland it did earn us a lot of unexpected support but it also radicalized the population. My people see an increasing number of demonstrations demanding the removal of the Senate altogether. The citizenry isn't exactly amused with what they're seeing from the Senate right now. Praji announced. What do you mean right now? Their debates is still streamed live all across the Republic. You didn't order anything about the news crews covering the Senate session. The last time I checked they were still in place and filming. Praji explained. Obi-Wan stared at the minister for long moments. He groaned and face-palmed when his tired mind worked through the implications. If things in the chamber were as bad as he feared he might have accidentally destroyed what little faith the regular citizens had left in that institution. Perhaps in the Republic as a whole. You didn't. Mothma spluttered after gaping at the revelation. She has been trying to convince some of her acquaintances that the current measures were just temporarily and would be lifted the moment the Senate elected a Chancellor of Barring that once a new and functional Senate could be set up. It's special then. Satine shook her head at her husband. If she didn't know better she would have assumed that this wasn't an oversight at all. It could prove very convenient if looked at through the right light. We still don't have enough support to make it work. Kenobi protested. We might not have a choice. Valentra frowned. What would happen if we present it as a fact? How many of the local governments might rally to our flag because they lack a better alternative? Not necessary enough. Obi-Wan admitted. Damn it. Satine grimaced. The answer is obvious but you won't like it. There's very little that happened lately I liked. What's on your mind? Obi-Wan asked. Withdraw Gar support from any system that isn't strategically vital if they don't support us. Valentra grit his teeth. That was exceedingly dirty trick. He loathed the very idea. 
It might work but even if it did it was going to be the death knell of the Republic. Whatever Besh lead to, the Republic as they knew it would be gone. However, wasn't that the case already? The Senate was non-functional. The government was fraying on the edges. There were riots not only on Coruscant but on an increasing number of core worlds. At least the separatists were lying low so far, though that might not necessarily be the case for much longer if things got even worse. Satine. This. Emotions flashed over Obi-Wan's face. This is madness, Mothma exclaimed. It would betray everything the Republic stands for. If you do this you'll paint yourself as a petty tyrant. Stood for you mean. Let us be honest here, the Republic is dying. It might as well be dead right now. Satine shot back. While they argued, staff members continued to update the situation and field angry calls from all over the Republic. Obi-Wan looked over the various displays. Riots were breaking on over a thousand worlds and that number was steadily increasing as the news spread and people figured out what was happening on Coruscant. There were demands to oppose the perceived coup, others gleefully endorsed it in hopes of gaining power or that someone would finally clean up the corruption on Coruscant. There were the usually malcontents using the chaos to cause trouble. The Senate sounded like they were more divided than ever even if they had a unifying cause to get behind, their hatred of Obi-Wan. The Republic we swore to protect is gone. Kenobi's voice was a torn whisper. There's merely a rotting carcass in its place and the only thing we could do now is put it out of its misery and build something better in its place. When it came that realization and admission was surprisingly easy to make. Too easy and Obi-Wan hated them for it. Inform the media that I'll make an announcement in one hour. Get on the comm with our allies and give them heads up. Make sure that the most important governments who aren't yet on board are aware of the consequences if they decide to go their own way. Besh is a go. Why was so easy to deliver the coup de grace to the Republic? All he felt right then was sadness and relief. Equals RK equals. Armadala's apartment. Republica 500. Coruscant. Anakin Skywalker was stuck under house arrest. There was a whole company of clones in the building with two more deployed at the ground levels. They weren't actually there to keep him contained, no that was strictly secondary. Their job was to keep protesters and the media away. They were mostly successful too, so far. The last loyal Jedi on Coruscant sat on the sofa and stared at the news in stunned disbelief. Halcyon droned on and on as GNN showed what was happening in the Senate. This was what Palpatine had to deal with on a daily basis since Anakin knew him. His respect for the Chancellor rose even further. The man somehow could make that pack of vermin actually work for the benefit of the Republic, though Skywalker would never know how. Anakin knew that Padme and Obi-Wan were getting desperate and might have to do something distasteful to make the Senate do their damn jobs. When this mess began, Skywalker was actually gleeful. Locking in the hut spawns until they elected a Chancellor? That was a masterful stroke. Their attempt to fire Obi-Wan was quite amusing too. What followed in the next hours was less so. Kurusk interrupted. If GNN and the other news agencies knew what they were talking about, the same was happening all over the Republic. It was sheer madness. Why were people rioting in support of the Senate after they saw how little those politicians cared about anyone but themselves? He could understand those who wanted the Senate removed. He could emphasize with their point of view. But the others? Just, why? As the hours passed and the situation deteriorated, Anakin kept stewing in an ever-growing frustration. There were more and more statements of governments condemning Kenobi's coup. He was helpless to do anything and that was infuriating. Didn't those people see what was happening on Coruscant for more than a month now? Didn't they understand that the Republic needed a strong leadership to win the war and eradicate the corruption uncovered by Palpatine? Or were most of those opposed to Obi-Wan's actions actually on it and afraid what a working, honest Republic government would mean for them? Anakin narrowed his eyes at the screen. That actually made sense. Did the rot spread further than even Palpatine feared? The Senate. They weren't the real problem but the symptom. That revelation sneaked on Skywalker as the struggle to understand why so many governments chose to oppose the one group who was doing something about the war and the mess that was the current situation. As he thought about it, that idea became more and more plausible. Anakin hoped that Padme and Obi-Wan had good plans in place to bring justice, security and stability to the Republic. It looked like he would figure it out soon along with the rest of the galaxy it seemed, because GNN announced that Kenobi would be making a statement soon. Equals RK equals. Part 10. Equals RK equals. 
Senate Building, Coruscant. Obi-Wan stood on the platform overseeing the large plaza next to the Senate. That was the same place where the Gar rallied and prepared for deployment across the galaxy after first geonosis, something that felt like an eternity ago. Behind him stood his wife and all his political allies who were present on Coruscant. Yet, Obi-Wan felt alone. He could see at least a million people demonstrating and rioting below. Whole clone divisions were deployed to strengthen the tin cordon of Coruscant security personnel struggling to hold the line. Such scenes unfolded across the whole Republic and it was his fault. He set these events in motion, yet Obi-Wan wasn't even sure that he was doing the right thing, merely that all the other options he had left were worse. How could he lead when he lacked conviction? How could persuade the trillions on Coruscant alone that they should support him when he himself had doubts? The only answer Kenobi had was simple, because he had to. It was his duty and that along with Satine was all he had left in the galaxy. Obi-Wan gave himself an hour to gather his courage and make a peace with himself as well as he could as much as it was meant to give time for his allies across the Republic to prepare. Technically that gave one last chance to the Senate to be sensible for once, but he didn't hold any real hope of anything positive coming from that corner. Now, time finally ran out. Kenobi was still doubtful. His consciences continued to plague him. Thirty seconds and you'll live, General. A GNN reporter gave him a thumbs up. Thank you. Obi-Wan answered on autopilot. Kenobi braced himself. There was no more time, nor place for doubt. There could be no turning back now. Doing so would be as much a disaster as an outright failure at what was to come, perhaps even worse. He had to make everyone listen and understand, not to oppose his efforts. Support would be preferable if not agreement. Obi-Wan went to the last ally he had left, the one that was beside him since his birth. The Force sang around him as he surrendered to her. Even as he could feel the great shadow looming over her breath, the pure untainted power of the Force steeled his resolve. Obi-Wan's perception expanded. He could sense the emotions of the crowds. Their fears, hopes and anger. Their frustrations and despair. The pain they felt. It was like a tangible cloud of depression clung to Coruscant and he was merely scratching the surface. Determination filled Obi-Wan's heart. This couldn't stand. He had to change it before he succumbed to. The GNN man gave him the agreed signal. It was on. My fellow citizens of the Republic, I wish I could address you at a better time. Kenobi began in a solemn tone. The Force was his guide and that gave him hope he wouldn't criff up at this most important time. It's been almost six weeks since the Jedi coup. For that long the Senate debated. Argued over petty squabbles. Maneuvered for power while the Republic tethers on the edge of oblivion. They risk the fruits of a golden age for personal gain. I say no more. Kenobi's voice carried around the Senate building. Over the airwaves and the holonet. The rioting on Coruscant subdued as something in his words echoed in the hearts of every man, woman and child who heard them. People turned to look at the closest source of Holonet news to see the general speaking to them and they had no doubt he was talking to them and not some distant politicians hidden behind cordons of scared guards. For years, the Senate proved again and again that it was not up to the task to safeguard your interests. People tell me that really wasn't its role. They point out that the senators are sent here to represent the interests of their home worlds. They tell me that the Senate was built from the ground up to limit the ability of the Republic to meddle in the affairs of its individual members. Obi-Wan paused and looked into the cameras with earnest, determined eyes. For the people who watched that broadcast live, it felt he examined their very souls. Recent events proved them right. I don't see a Senate concerned with the future of the Republic. Neither one who cares about its citizens. I see small-minded people who risk us all to maintain their own power and importance. Their inactions keeps the Grand Army of the Republic paralyzed for more than a month now. If it wasn't for enemy logistics difficulties, this criminal behavior would have seen more of the core fall prey to the separatists. For too long those of us still believing in the ideals of the Republic found ourselves constrained by a Senate that simply doesn't care. We saw our friends and family torn away from us by this terrible war. We saw whole worlds ravaged and poisoned by the likes of Grievous and Dooku all the while the Senate gave us only the bare minimum of support that Chancellor Palpatine could persuade, bribe and threaten them to provide. Obi-Wan paused for breath. Kenobi was at a crossroads. The Force didn't push him to make a choice, though he was sure she wanted to. He could perceive the light and dark side clashing behind the edge of his perceptions. All the light could give him was the facts. 
he knew what course of action had a better chance to sway the people of the Republic. He could barely see the possibilities beyond a general outline, but that was enough. Obi-Wan could appeal to people's better nature. Could ask for their support and he would get it, at least here on Coruscant. He could attempt to save the Republic even as it was tumbling over the edge into the abyss. Kenobi could also see what would most likely happen all across Republic space. His good intentions would be twisted and used by populists for personal gain. The Republic would fragment at best. His actions today cause too much damage. Yesterday, if the Senate was actually working, if there was a strong Chancellor who the average citizens and enough local governments trusted, things might be different. Today? What did that leave him? He had to give the people a cause to rally against. He had to give them an enemy to point at. That was his best chance, yet Obi-Wan was terrified of where that way led. It wasn't that going with it would plunge the galaxy in a future shrouded by darkness. It was that no matter what he did at this juncture, such an outcome was inevitable. From what he gathered by the Force, neither path could be considered darker than the other. Why was he thinking only about those two extremes? The answer came as fast as he thought about it. The time of half-measures was past. On one hand he could attempt to preserve the rotten corpse that was the Republic, on the other was delivering the last blow himself, right here and now and taking advantage of the fallout to seize power. Anything else would lead to more pointless chaos and a never-ending quagmire. He was committed. Obi-Wan figured out that he made his choice the moment he decided to go along with Satine's crazy scheme. Everything else was pointless denial. He was sure Vale would be laughing his ass off when he learned that Obi-Wan went with his suggestion from back on Mandalore. As the Supreme Commander of the Republic military, I will tell you the sad truth. It was mere good fortune that allowed us to survive the first critical months of this war. It was the sacrifices of countless heroes from all over the Republic and beyond that gave us the successes that pushed the enemy back. And it was the negligence of the Senate over the previous centuries that saw the Republic unable to properly defend itself. It was the lack of that support that still means we lack the ships and people to protect the whole Republic. It was because of that treachery that we had to abandon thousands of star systems to the enemy or risk the collapse our war effort. And finally, it was the Senate's endless debates that gave enough time for Admiral Trench to secure four of the five brothers at Corellia. It was their corrupt ways that still give the enemy yet more time to dug in and make our liberation of the core and test of the Republic a needlessly bloody affair. Obi-Wan could experience the effect his words had on the people gathered below him. Their anger grew and grew. Now it had a clear focus. He hated himself for doing this. He loathed the fact that the brush of their emotions gave him a small but very real amount of joy. Yet, he continued. The Senate proved itself worse than useless. It is now a clear detriment for the Republic and the war effort. This my friends, cannot be allowed to stand. Ten years ago, the then Queen Almadala believed that it was merely a question of leadership. She was right at the time, since his election Chancellor Palpatine proved himself as the most capable and devoted man to held the office in centuries. Obi-Wan looked down sadly. It was a grave tragedy that his life was cut short. His death deprived the Republic of her greatest servant, for Sheev Palpatine was its last and best hope. More quietly he added, sadly, I am no Chancellor Palpatine. Persuading the Senate to do their job proved beyond my capabilities. Yet, I can't allow such a failure to deter me. I still have my duty to you, the people of the Republic. I ask for your support in these treacherous times. Cries of Palpatine, echoed from Bello. Obi-Wan could taste a growing sense of hope under the anger. He was going to use it. We, the Republic government Kenobi nodded to where he knew Minister Praji and all likely-minded high-ranking civil servants who could be spared stood. They took a step forward. Those senators who recognize that the Senate is no longer capable to execute its functions, now it was time for Bail Organa, Padme Amidala, Mon Mothma and their allies to step closer, and the armed forces of the Republic, Admiral Yularen and General Valentro accompanied by a small crowd of colonels and starship captains were next to rise up to the occasion, along with many local governments, Kuit, Corellia, Anaxes, Serapin, the systems collectively represented by the Midrim Alliance along with many others have a declaration to make. All across Coruscant the rioting paused. Obi-Wan's words had a hypnotic effect and those who listened to him knew that something momentous was about to happen. We declare the Republic Senate dissolved. 
its functions will be taken by a body of representatives appointed by the local governments for the duration of the Clone Wars and new elections will be held after the conflict's resolution. The first session of that body will take place tonight and their only agenda will be the election of a Chancellor. Those governments unable to appoint a representative for this body in such a short amount of time will be represented for this session by their government leaders using the Holonet as a means to communicating their vote. Relief and hope blossomed, displacing a lot of the anger, though it continued to burn brightly in a tremendous number of hearts. The emotions Obi-Wan felt were enough to make him drunk with power. He had to struggle to keep his mind mostly clear. His speech wasn't over yet. Kenobi for Chancellor, someone shouted. The crowd below the Senate paused, while they considered the idea. Then more and more people picked up the cry. What Obi-Wan felt at that moment as the center for the emotions of millions and soon billions was indescribable. What came next was one of the hardest things he ever did. This sense of power. It went to his head. Walking away from it was all but unthinkable, yet somehow Obi-Wan found the moral fortitude to do it. I will be forever thankful for this sentiment and the trust it represents. However, I will have to decline. I am a general first. The best way I can serve you all is by leading the Grand Army against the Separatists and ensuring that they are neutralized as a threat once and for all. If you want to support someone who has proven their dedication to democracy, peace and the well-being of her people, then please support my wife, Ambassador Satine Kenobi. It was technically illegal for her to be elected Chancellor. Mandalore wasn't a part of the Republic after all. Yet today for an all intents and purposes the Republic died. Obi-Wan just murdered her. Despite what those people supporting him believed, this new Chancellor that would be elected tonight, wasn't going to be a war for the Republic. They would be the leader of a military alliance aimed against the Separatists. Everything else would have to be decided at a later date, preferably before what was left of the Republic government ceased to function completely. Lying by omission to that many people made Obi-Wan sick to the core of his soul. They believed in him. Trusted that he would save the Republic without realizing that he just destroyed it in front of their eyes. Shattered Union. Equals RK equals. Part 1. Equals RK equals. The Black Hole. Nashada. I hope this isn't a waste of time, brother. Darth Maul, the Dark Lord of the Sith barked at his brother. The months after their reunion were frustrating. Maul's recovery thanks to that which on Dathomir was still a sore spot for him. He owed the infernal woman more than he was willing to admit even to himself and that knowledge burned buried deep within him. She hasn't steered us wrong yet, brother. Savage Opress sat down across the table from Maul and shoved a mug of ale his way. They could barely hear each other without screaming over the music coming from multiple hidden loudspeakers. The bar was drowning in shadows and choking in the smoke of enough illegal drugs to irritate even a Sith. The black hole had earned its name. It was one of the seediest, nastiest places Maul had the misfortune to visit and while he worked for Sidious he had seen some of the greatest hives of scum and villainy in the galaxy. This place was much worse. That was why they were stuck in there waiting for someone who supposedly had a job offer, who would think a self-respecting Sith would be in the black hole without burning the place for fun. Maul suspected that it might be a trap, they did successfully take a banking clan convoy a few weeks back. It was a good way to raise capital to finance his vengeance, however he expected that sooner or later some bounty hunters would come searching for them because of it. He was half convinced that this was it and the primary reason he came was the chance for some fun. Yet, he might be mistaken. That infernal witch was very smug when she met them just before leaving Dathomir to warn them they might find what they were looking for on this trip. Witches. If they weren't so useful. If Mother Tanzin wasn't one of them. Even she wasn't enough to keep him from wanting to show them their place. He was the Dark Lord of the Sith. What did they do? Kept hiding when they could do so much more? It was pathetic. Two armored figures made their way through the crowd, which consisted of half-drunk or high patrons trying to dance or simply stumbling between the tables. It looks like fun, brother. Maul nodded at the approaching figures. Mandalorians, Opress sneered. Bounty hunters? What else? Maul's right hand went for the hilt of his lightsaber. The leader of the two, a man a bit taller than the woman who walked a step behind him, halted a couple of paces from the Sith table and examined them. I expected you to be taller. The man grumbled. I have a job for you. What could a Mandalorian offer me? Maul sneered. Such a clumsy trap. Did that fool think something like this could make him drop his guard? 
vengeance. An opportunity to prove yourself against another Sith. The man offered. I want Vale and his whore dead. You want Kenobi. Why would someone like you turn against Mandalore? It was Savage's turn to sneer at the ridiculous claim. He murdered my brother. I can't take him in honorable combat, yet I crave his blood. The Mandalorian offered. Maul was about to laugh and attack, yet he stayed his hand. He could feel no deception from the man. Only anger and hatred. He did laugh at that. The Force was with him and he would have his vengeance. Speak. This better be good. More lauded. Equals RK equals. Gar Operations Room. Gar HQ. Coruscant. Yes. Prime Minister Holt. I promise you I will do everything in my power to rein Vale in. If he really went crazy Sith on us I will do my best to ensure he will face justice for his actions. Obi-Wan swore. We might have to do so even if he's legally in the clear. A CEO said. Where was he from again? Even with the force refreshing him Obi-Wan was getting exhausted. He won't allow himself to be thrown to the Krat hounds to appease the crowd. Satine warned. What choice do we have? There are millions, billions even screaming for his head. There are at least that many cheering his actions. I find that more disturbing. Mothma interjected. He is a head of independent state and that complicates things. You don't say. Vale's one of the few people left that the Gar universally respects. Removing him could backfire on us. Would it matter if you get the clones under control? Tell that to the Mandalorians and anyone in the Midrim who might support him. It might matter to them. That's more or less academic at this point. Until he can fight his way to the core or we can reconnect with that part of the Rim we have no way of influencing what he does or doesn't do. Shall we shelf this topic until it becomes relevant? It is relevant. We have to explain to our people what we are going to do about that madman. Tell them the truth, we're investigating and if he's found guilty of whatever he's accused of we'll act accordingly. Satine spoke. In other words, empty promises. What else is new? The man is a war criminal. He needs to answer for his deeds. Mandalore hasn't been found guilty of anything. I know many of my people would argue he went after legitimate targets at Salast. We know nothing but separatist propaganda about Kamino. Do you think that those worlds in the Mid-Rim, especially Naboo, would work with him unless he had a very good explanation? Satine asked. The man saved them. They were attacked with plague by the separatists. Would Naboo care? Should we care then? You're right, my esteemed colleague. A new voice sneered. The Separatists unleashed plague against us. They enslaved our people. Who should we care if Vale retaliates in kind? Would you stand up self-righteous in front of us if the same happened to Hawk? We should care. There are laws civilized society operates under, but you would know nothing about it. There are common laws of war that make what Vale did at Sullust legal reprisal for Naboo and Ryloth. Yular encountered. Unwritten laws. How in the name of the Force did I get myself in this mess? Obi-Wan screamed internally. Personally he was unfamiliar with most of the people arguing over the holocom. They all had a few things in common. They were government leaders from all over the part of the Republic Coruscant could have secure communications with and they all had their agendas. It was primarily the fear of the separatists that united them. They were almost as bad as the Senate but not quite, which was the one ray of hope in the whole mess. We need to recall Vale as soon as practical so he could explain actions. I think we all can agree on that. Prime Minister Holt asked. To Obi-Wan's surprise they actually could. Ku it is in agreement. What else do we need to clear up before voting in the next Chancellor? Ambassador Kenobi is Mandalorian. Not a Republic member. It doesn't really matter now, does it? It is for us to decide who the next Chancellor is going to be. More arguing followed. More wasted time. Yet, there was a vote in the end. Satine won with a very minor majority. Congratulations. Obi-Wan smiled. Relief flooded him. This whole exercise wasn't a colossal waste of time. Now it was time to see if the clones would listen to his wife or not. Equals Arche equals. Historical notes. Equals RK equals. The second betrayal. The great treason. The day that democracy died. Who doesn't know of it? Various spineless traitors sold us all to the Mandalorians, Sith and Quati for power and worthless so-called security. Secessionists tore at our glorious civilization that gave us all a millennium of peace, prosperity and real security. 
from intercepted ARR broadcast. ARR, Alliance to Restore the Republic. Equals RK equals. Gar's treason was the one blow that ultimately shattered the Galactic Republic. Or did it really? Nowadays people tend to forget that until that fateful day on Coruscant, the military followed lawful orders as they perceived them. Say what you will about the clone legions that made an overwhelming number of the armed forces at the time, however they backed the Galactic Republic until the foundation of the Empire. Certain legions did it even after it happened. When we look at the final years of the Galactic Republic, it becomes obvious that it had major structural problems. It was also clear that Chancellor Palpatine, the last man to lead a whole republic, did his best to fix those issues. His assassination heralded the end of the Galactic Republic as the hegemony presiding over most of the known galaxy. How did it happen? Why? What or who caused what some call the fall of civilization? There are many answers that hold a grain of truth. Many more assumption or even outright lies at the heart of it. The one issue that doomed the Galactic Republic was the different, often clashing interests of the member nations, especially those in the core. The fall of Corellia heralded a new era. Suddenly, Kuwait was the unchallenged industrial hegemon. That single system and the family of the same name that ruled it had unlimited power within reach and practically everyone in the Senate believed that they would grasp for it. This is perhaps the key issue that broke the Galactic Republic, the promise of practically unlimited power, economic, industrial, military, political and most importantly, personal. The fall of the Galactic Republic came in hand with great tragedies, missed opportunities and mistrust that made it all but inevitable. The man often accused by the Empire as the one person who could have saved the Galactic Republic was the same one who was ready to step away from a position of absolute power if he was elected as Chancellor, Senator Danu of Kuwait. He was Kuwait's candidate for the post. That very fact served to unite friends and enemies alike in fear that he would become a legally empowered dictator with the military, economic and political strength to enforce his rule. Danu's is a tragic tale. Too late people believed that he spoke the truth from the beginning and the last, the best hope of the Republic and democracy slipped away as the Senate argued. The Republic made its decision on who to blame from the beginning too. The Kenobis. One was the commanding general of the Gar, arguably the most powerful man in the Republic after the murder of Chancellor Palpatine. His wife, Satine Kenobi, nay Kreese, the then ambassador of Mandalore. Republic loyalists still argue who bears more of the blame. Is it the general who they claim betrayed his oaths and everything he professed to stand for? Or perhaps the foreign ambassador who bribed and threatened her way to power and got herself illegally elected as a chancellor? To this day anyone would be hard-pressed to find out a consensus among the Republic loyalists. Yet, they are still united in hatred in their passion to restore democracy and freedom to the rest of the galaxy. The Fall of Civilization, the Fragmentation of the Galactic Republic by Merkilex first published by Dorin Press Corporation. Equals RK equals. Can you believe this Druk? Chancellor Ernan Volin snapped. She glared at her colleagues. If any of this leaks to the media I'll know who to blame. No worries there, Eerie. Don't eerie me, Aro. Ernan leveled her glare at the interior. Minister, Aro Qualey. The Zabrak frowned at her. I don't like it any more than you do. We agreed, this was our best option. A hollow laugh escaped Hernan's lips. We have to support a damned monster. Because he's good at killing the right people. The Chancellor sneered. I can see where they're coming from. The Defense Minister raised both hands in a forestalling gesture. I'm not saying that I agree, merely that I understand their reasoning. No wonder the Republic went to hell, Ernan mumbled. What's to understand? A Sith killing people because it's convenient? It's not like the average citizen cares much what happens in the Outer Rim as long as it doesn't directly affect them. We've seen it again and again, all across the core. Qualey pointed out. They have concerns closer to home. So should we. Recording of Fornax's system government meeting. Leaked to GNN by unknown party. Equals RK equals. This is Chancellor Satine Kenobi to all Republic forces. Contingency Order 66 is no longer in effect. All Republic forces in the Corps are to follow Gar High Command orders. All Republic forces cut off across the galaxy, you're to evade destruction if at all possible, regroup to previously designated staging areas and ensure the security of Republic worlds and UAU if practical. General Delcatar Vale, 
you are directed to report to Karusk and Tasap to answer questions over the conduct of your forces at Camino and Sullust. Record of Chancellor Satine Kreese giving her first official orders to Gar elements across the galaxy, minutes after her controversial election. Equals RK equals. I need more assets to keep that Sith from gaining access to all nearby sectors. If the enemy break through Triton's defenses they will be in striking range of dozens of lightly defended worlds. There was ire in TK9953's electronic voice. Not happening. We're throwing everything we have at Ariadu and the Sith. We have to break the Republic there and at Naboo. A dull modulated voice responded. The Theocrat demands that we bring in additional defenses to secure Triton. I'm receiving an increasing number of demands to garrison the nearby systems. I need more assets. The droid pressed. There are no more assets we can justify releasing to your region of space. Once Vale is neutralized it won't be an issue. If he isn't neutralized? Then you are to hold Triton at all cost. A recording found in declassified CIS archives Shattered Union. Equals RK equals. Part 2. Equals RK equals. Officer Quarters. Republic Cruiser Reconciliation. Iriadu. Was getting a few hours of peaceful sleep that much to ask for? First, there were a few unsettling dreams I couldn't properly recall, just a sense of unease that usually came when some of my past caught up to me at night. Then, my reluctant passenger decided to play moral compass on me. I don't get you. Shark T hissed waspishly in my head. This was getting bothersome. At least now I had just a single force ghost stuck in the dark corners of my mind. While irritating it was a far cry from the last time. I'm not that complicated. I groaned and stretched. Even days later, my body was still recovering from the strain I put on myself back at Sallust. Damn this war, it didn't let me find the time to figure out what was wrong with the force. At this rate, one of these days I might actually get myself killed in a rather embracing fashion after exhausting myself. Everything I experienced in your memories tells me you loathe slavery, T snapped. I most certainly do. I gave her a mental nod. It wasn't like I went out of my way to keep it a secret even in the Empire, much less nowadays. Didn't she had anything better to do than pester me? It was too early to deal with a bothersome Jedi. No, I don't. T glared. It was weird experiencing and knowing she did it while stuck in my head. You kept Vetu as a slave when Barras so graciously gave her to you. You had no problem working with the Hutts and just a month ago you enslaved hundreds of thousands at Camino. T snapped. Yes? Is there a question or are you just getting off of irritating me this early in the morning? I grumbled. How? Did she just splutter in my head? I rubbed my forehead in an attempt to forestall a headache. It didn't really work. You really don't get it, do you, Jedi? I groaned a lad in a voice that was thick with exasperation. Because, I could. I believed it served my best interests at the time. I am a Sith and that means I am free from moral constraints, that of society and most importantly, I did my best to send Shark T a mental glare, from my own. How do I explain it in such a way that she could get it if that was even possible? For me my actions were perfectly logical given the information I had available at the time. I knew that other people might not see it that way, though some of the time I wasn't sure why. My best guess was that we saw the world in a very different way. That doesn't make sense. Are you out of your mind? Del Payne began throbbing behind my eyes. The dark side gives those who wield her many gifts. It cloaks us in shadows, helps us hide from the world at large. Most importantly, it helps us hide from ourselves. I told her. Yet, even now, you claim you haven't fallen to the dark side. I could taste the bitter accusation in T's words. It swarmed outwards from her corner of my mind until it shrouded her presence like a warm cloak. You should know better by now. I'm not a nice man. I chose to become a monster of my own free will and the dark side ensured that my conscience was no obstacle. I didn't need to fall to see clearly, Shark T. How could I? I chuckled at that thought. When you aren't constrained by morality, you would be surprised how many previously unfinsible ideas suddenly become feasible. Practical. How is burning whole worlds anything but insanity? My resident and troublesome Jedi exclaimed. Why not do it if it serves a purpose? I shot back. You murdered hundreds of millions, perhaps billions at Sullust yet you act as it was nothing. Because it was no big deal. Billions? Trillions? 
I didn't know them, Jedi. I had no emotional investment in their fate. All I regret is the waste of industry and potential that gets destroyed and is yet to be destroyed in this war. People die, whole worlds with them. So what? Why should I care beyond the impact their loss has on the war and economy? T stared at me horrified. Individuals matter to me, Jedi and precious little of them. Anyone else? I shrugged. Why should I care? Why should I lose any sleep over those destroyed by my actions? They were unlucky enough to be in my way. They didn't have the power and skill to survive. That's the ultimate truth of our existence. Morality? Intentions? Without sufficient power to back them, they mean nothing. You actually believe this? This. Madness. There was a sense of finality in T's words. I'm not sure she understood or even cared to try. What I knew was that she made up her mind and apparently dismissed me as just another madman. Bloody Jedi. Oh, I understand. An impressive sneer echoed through my mind. You were an insane psychopath who let power get to his head. You didn't even notice falling to the dark side, because it hardly made you any worse than you already were. You were merely afraid of the consequences before you got enough power in your clutches to avoid facing justice for your crimes. That's certainly one way to look at it. Justice. Right. Do you think I would find a single grain of justice if I shred this whole star system to dust, Shark T? When the Sith Empire came back from the unknown regions and invaded the Republic, the Sith called it justice. When centuries earlier the Jedi and their precious Republic genocided the true Sith and did its best to make the very idea of the Sith extinct, they called it justice. Tell me, Jedi, how many people on Naboo would call my actions at Sulla's justice for what the Separatists did to them? No one in their right mind. T stood defiantly against me. Her ghostly form blazed with determination and wisps of the light side energy that made my headache worse. It's not for you to decide what justice is or if it exists. You won't judge, jury or executioner. The sheer hubris. T shook her head. I pity you, you know. You can't even comprehend how far you've fallen. Not trying to make me redeem myself. I let her bask in my amusement. You? You need to want redemption if you are to have a chance at it and you veil, would laugh at the very thought. I wonder. If you aren't completely insane, what would have your original thought of you? Trying to play dirty now? It doesn't matter. He would have died at Korriban, fallen at best. It was my time as a soldier for the Eurasian Federation that gave me a chance. Yet, even with that experience, the man who walked out of the Sith Academy wasn't the same who went in. I have many regrets in my life. Jedi. Becoming a Sith, supporting the Empire, those actions aren't among them. Yet you engineered the civil war that destroyed the Sith Empire. Are you blind, a fool or merely willfully ignorant? When did I ever say that I supported the Sith Empire? My allegiance was to the Empire, to the ideal of order it brought. To the soldiers who fought beside me and supported me to the end. To their families and loved ones, because those people mattered to said soldiers. It was that simple. What couldn't she get it? You are such a hypocrite, T said it as if it was some grand revelation. Of course I am. The Sith I intend to forge won't be like me. If they are, we will inevitably tear the galaxy apart. Jedi, freedom is wonderful and terrible thing. That is the pinnacle of being a Sith and in the end I will deny it to the Sith order I intend to create. You poor wretched little man, T sighed. I'm quite wealthy, as you well know. I shot back. It's funny you know. You Jedi are the ever-present protectors of the Republic, of your valued democracy, yet not of freedom. Not really. Pure disbelieving indignation radiated from Shark T, who was momentarily at loss of words at the accusation. Of course we are, T snapped at me. Her composure cracked and the light of the force that made her form shine dimmed. Are you? Where was the order a decade ago when Nobu was invaded? Where were you when your vaunted democracy failed in the Senate? Where were you as the huts enslaved billions upon billions? Four thousand years ago the Jedi just stood and watched from their ivory towers. They and the old Republic even allied with factions among the huts when it was convenient. Here we are, thousands of years late and your kind did nothing to change what happens in hut space. Look me in the eyes and tell me why. T opened her mouth, then closed it and glared at me. Do you think I like it? I've seen slavery. Since the war began I've been an accomplice to it. Poison dribbled off T's words. I had to train clones so they would go out, fight and die for a cause that isn't theirs, for people who don't give a damn about them. 
I've been to hot space. I've seen what happens out there. What do you want me to say? That I would want to see all those worms face their just rewards? The Republic was in no state do anything officially. We are seen as agents of the Republic. Our actions reflect on it. We did as much as we could. When it's convenient. Otherwise, you look the other way and believe that it was for the best. You had to see the bigger picture. I spoke gently. When the war began you did accept the clone armies without a second thought. We had no choice. Without the clones we would have lost. I know. I smiled. You weren't willing to pay the price for not using a slave army when you needed it, yet you dare judge me for doing the same? I'm not the only hypocrite here, Sharp T. I believe that keeping Veto as my slave was in my best interest and wasn't willing to pay the price of releasing her. I believe the same at Camino. Was it the scale that make you so furious at my actions? The fact that I could keep my conscience from bothering me? Or is it because you and the rest of the Jedi did the same bloody thing? For the best of reasons of course. Whatever lets you sleep easier at night. Don't twist my words. We are nothing alike. The look of indignation on her face was priceless. I don't have to. You know my goals. You saw my memories. I have no problem with you deciding to stand against me and my vision of the future, Shark T. The reasons you decided to do it however, those infuriate me. And to think I decided to show you a modicum of trust before you turned around and stabbed me in the bag. Such a waste. You really believe that, don't you? T laughed hollowly. The council was right after all, Sith. Your king is a pack of mad dogs and the galaxy would be better without you. That might very well be the case. I am a selfish creature. If the situation warrants it I would watch the galaxy burn around me and I might very well enjoy every moment of it. There isn't a proper word to describe your unique brand of madness in any language I know, nor for your sheer arrogance. Anger throbbed all around T making her ethereal form a stunning thing to behold. Compliments will get you nowhere. I was very pleased with myself at how well I got under her shimmering skin. Why the Force saw fit to curse us with you I will never know. What makes you think that the Force is to blame for my presence? I won't take your delusions at face value. Your loss. I drew on the dark side and slammed a pitch black barrier between us. Hopefully I would get a bit of sleep now. I was just drifting on when the alarms began screaming. Damn it, what went to hell this time? Equals RK equals. Part 3. Equals RK equals. Mandalorian Embassy. Coruscant Satine Kenobi fidgeted, while her sister examined her as if she was something unnatural that just crawled out of a waste disposal bin. You're the new Chancellor of the Galactic Republic. Bo spoke slowly, carefully tasting each word. Yep. Satine nodded. She really should have thought how this scheme would affect her on a personal level. Oh, politically it actually made sense, if barely and in a terribly convoluted way befitting the unholy mess that the Senate made of while everything. The very big, pointedly visible security detail was just the tip of the iceberg. Chancellor or not, she couldn't come visit her sister and arrange for someone else to become Mandalore's new ambassador until the relationship between her home nation and the Republic could be straightened and further formalized, something that simply couldn't happen before Mandalore himself deigned to drag his ass away from his midrim shenanigans. After what happened to Palpatine, the Gar was determined not to lose another Chancellor and Soutine was pretty sure they were overcompensating and not just because she was their commanding general's wife. What did that captain tell her earlier? We actually like Kenobi and Vale. Especially Vale. They go out of their way to make sure we don't get killed because of restricted rows, not enough air and orbital support and other things that have nothing to do with fighting a war. We're keeping you in one piece, Mom or we die trying. Satine thought better not to remind the good soldier that not too long ago she was one of those more vocal about how the war must not be escalated or how collateral damage must be kept to a minimum. She technically still had the same mindset, though it was tempered by a hefty dose of reality. Satine wasn't ready to admit it in public, even to her husband yet, however in the aftermath of Death Watch's coup she got an epiphany. Restricting rules of engagement, striving to minimize collateral damage, something that including avoiding killing civilians, inevitably meant that the soldiers on the ground often had to suffer heavier casualties to get the job done. She could see how they would resent orders that could get them and their friends killed or maimed. 
orders given by politicians who were far away from the front and as often as not did it just to keep their approval ratings up instead of any genuine concern for the poor people caught between the GAR and separatists droid armies. Bo continued to watch her oddly and didn't really notice Satine's lapse in concentration. How did you manage that? I knew you were going to kick the whole house of cards and hope everything fell in somewhat manageable chaos but... Bo grinned. I'm proud of you sister. You did what no other Mandalorian has ever done. Come here so I can give you a hug. Satine winced at the reminder that due to her ongoing series of cybernetic enhancements, currently Bo had her mobility curtailed quite a bit until whatever she consented to being put in her spine settled down or something. Once she did make the mistake of looking over an abbreviated list of those enhancements and they made her queasy. By the time it was all done, Bo was going to be more machine than a woman. And she was giddy by the prospect. The worst thing was that Satine couldn't really blame that Sith for this sorry state of affairs. She knew her sister good enough to see where she was coming from. Not that it made her feel any better. Satine sighed and went to the couch where Bo was lounging. She got a bone-cracking hug for her troubles too. Bo. Air. Sorry. Bo winced, then very gingerly lightly patted her shoulder. My sister. Chancellor of the Republic. How is that working out for you? I didn't really knew what I was getting myself into. Don't repeat that, please. Satine winced. I won't, I promise. That bad? Worse. The Senate is still making trouble, the riots and protests all over the place are yet to stop despite everyone's best efforts. My clandestine election didn't help matters. Not really. Hey, I saw your address. It was quite good, I think. I'm just not sure how well it would go down back home. Bo shrugged. Getting some reinforcements pushed to Mandalore might make up for that. At least most of the clones seem eager to listen. That was the biggest gamble, if the clones didn't accept her as a legitimate chancellor everything would have been for naught. Still, there were a lot of units that didn't. Too many in fact, some on Coruscant too. Obi-Wan had to deal with that and barring a miracle it was going to get very ugly. That's great. When are they leaving? Bo perked up. You aren't going with them even if I have to call the good soldiers keeping me in one piece and have them park a tank on you. You won't be clear to go get yourself shot up anytime soon. Satine glared at her sister. I don't do it on purpose you know. It still happens. Not my fault. Blame the Jedi. She both thought for a moment. My husband too, along with the Death Watch. Not my fault. Satine gave her sister a disbelieving look. Speaking about my idiot of a husband. What's your official position on his shenanigans? Bo grumbled. Are you irritated with what he is apparently doing or because you aren't out there with him? Satine sighed. Well. Both? Bo asked in a small voice. Mostly the latter then, Satine concluded. Her sister smiled innocently. It was just like that time when they were little girls and Bo was caught red-handed with what was left of the pie. He's Mandalore, that gives him some political cover, yet it opens a whole different can of worms. My. Generals, and wasn't that a weird sentiment when it pertained to basically all the people running the Republic military, tell me he should be legally clear about Sallust. Acceptable military targets, Satine hissed. The very thought that this was the military's official position on the matter was unsettling. That Obi-Wan agreed on the legality if not morality of the act was even worse. Satine didn't really want to think about her one attempt to probe the reactions of her security detail on the manor. They were in all the maniacs. Ah, that's good. Bo relaxed. You know there will be trouble in home if you find yourself forced to move against him even for appearance's sake. That possibility hasn't escaped me, Satine admitted. It was one of the big reasons against her taking the position of Chancellor. The possible political entanglements over just Vale's position as the one she owed allegiance were nightmare fuel. However, strictly speaking, she didn't need to be the Chancellor anymore. Not since the moment the majority of the clones in contact actually accepted her authority. In fact, the primary reason why she was actually elected was simple, the moment when they all went along with their scheme, the Republic died. It was now a corpse kept on life support for appearances sake. Her real job was to facilitate a working alliance against the separatists, continued operation of the most critical republic institutions and laying down the groundwork for the eventual re-establishing of the republic or something else to replace it. Preferably without the citizenry at large figuring out what was actually happening. 
That was one of the reason why she found the time to visit the embassy. It was officially to arrange for her replacement as Mandalorian ambassador so appearances of conflicting interests could be minimized a bit. Seeing Bo was a nice bonus. At least officially. The real reason she came was to take a brief pit stop and see her sister, though no one else needed to know that. Briefly the sisters sat leaning on each other lost in their own thoughts.